like to introduce our first panel, which is our panel on Zero Horizon Dawn. And our first, uh, our first paper is um, by Todd Williams, who, is, uh, who received his PhD in literary criticism and theory from Kent State University in Ohio, USA. He's an associate professor of English at Kutztown University of Pennsylvania, where he teaches composition and literature courses, including early world literature at Literature and, and Psychology. He's published multiple articles on pedagogy and Victorian authors. He's author of the books A Therapeutic Approach to Teaching Poetry and Christina Rossetti's Environmental Consciousness. He's become an avid gamer in recent years with a preference for games with engaging stories and compelling characters. So Todd's paper is called The Potential Effect of Alloy's Eco-Feminist Terrorism on Players of Zero Horizon Dawn. Thank you so much for being with us today. If I could kindly ask you to share your screen and then we can have a look at your, your PowerPoint and take it away. Uh, I'm just going to read it, actually. I didn't yeah, do a PowerPoint. Yeah, no worries. We've got you. Are you all right to <laughs> I just try screen? To, I try to keep it simple. Actually. Oh, <laughs> so. no worries. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Gabe. Thanks for having me here, uh, everybody. Um, here we go. Uh, Horizon Zero Dawn has been widely praised by reviewers and academics for being both a feminist and environmentalist game. Lauren Woolbright, for one, refers to Aloy, the game's protagonist, as an eco-feminist protagonist and an intersectional heroine, in that she represents both gender progress and ecological thinking. <clears throat> Woolbright sees the game's hopeful message and ethics of care as both necessary and timely, concluding that in seeing our very extinction looming, players of the game have the chance to internalize eco-feminist ethics of care and act. While Woolbright offers some discussion of emotional connections to characters and gameplay based on Catherine Isbister's book, How Games Move Us, she says little about how this internalization might occur. An important question remains as to how the game's themes might actually translate into cultivating pro-environmental attitudes and actions in players. Here I will briefly examine the potential effectiveness of the game's eco-feminist ethics through three models and concepts used in the field of conservation psychology uh, that align with eco-feminism and with specific aspects of Horizon Zero Dawn. Uh, the value-belief norm model, environmental preference, and self-determination theory. My hope is that taken together, these models begin to explain more adequately how the game has potential to encourage pro-environmental as well as pro-social attitudes and actions. Generally, eco-feminist theorists seek to displace a culture of domination that negatively affects human relations with each other and with the earth. In her book, Gaia and God, Rosemary Ruther describes the field as such. Ecofeminism explores how male domination of women and domination of nature are interconnected, both in cultural ideology and in social structures, and more generally, how dominating and destructive relations to the earth are interrelated with gender, class, and racial domination. Horizon Zero Dawn's feminism largely comes through in its protagonist, Aloy, who is a highly capable female warrior hero. Yet there are many other strong female heroes or female characters throughout the narrative, and nearly all of the tribes in the game are fairly egalitarian along gender lines. Even the patriarchal sun-worshipping Karja have female warriors and hunters, though no female priests. In other areas of social, interse social intersectionality, the game presents a diverse cast of characters integrated with their tribes along racial, gender, and sexuality lines, while also critiquing the tribal and religious differences that continue to separate people. Aloy remains a model who rises above such tribalism and superstition throughout the game. The game's environmentalism occurs primarily in its portrayal of the old ones, the people who existed on, on the earth a thousand years before Aloy's time. These old ones are essentially us, humankind, in the 21st century, now and in the very near future as we deal with climate change and the global fallout that will come along with it. In Horizon Zero Dawn, environmental issues are initially solved during the clawback of the 2040s through technology developed by Elizabeth Sobeck. However, Sobeck's AI technology soon gets militarized by her boss, Ted Farrow, 
which leads to human-created military robots going rogue and literally consuming all life on Earth, an apt metaphor for human consumption of nature's resources to our own detriment. Horizon Zero Dawn offers players an alternative to a destructive worldview through Sobek and Aloy. In Gaia and God, Ruther describes the four horsemen of destruction for our time. Uh, one, human population explosion at the expense of plants and animals of the earth. Two, environmental damage to air, water, and soil. Three, the misery of growing masses of the poor and for a global militarization aimed at retaining unjust advantage over the Earth's resources for a wealthy elite. All of these issues of the old world are uncovered by Aloy, ideally leading players to reflect on and lament our current world and our destructive values and actions. As Ruther explains, it is the major culture and system of domination that has pressed humans and the Earth into the crises of ecological unsus unsustainability poverty, and militarism we now experience. However, players of Horizon Zero Dawn are presented with a new vision of how life should be more just and more caring in Sobek's great act of love and compassion for humanity, Project Zero Dawn. The pharaoh robot plague cannot be stopped before consuming the Earth and the people on it. However, Sobek finds a way to recreate life on Earth for its own sake and despite humanity's flaws. She does this out of sheer altruism and ultimately sacrifices herself for the project's success. Aloy is moved when she learns of Sobek's actions, though by this point in the game, Aloy has already established similar values in herself that she uses to deal with a new threat of global destruction. In many ways, the value belief norm or VBN model developed and empirically tested by Paul Stern brings together several psychological paradigms to provide evidence for the same intersectionality that is predominant in ecofeminist theory. The VBN model shows how certain values and beliefs can lead one to certain behavioral norms. Concerning environmentalism, Stern demonstrates that the values most strongly implicated in activating pro-environmental personal norms are altruistic or self-transcendent values, whereas egoistic values and traditional values such as obedience are largely associated, uh, are, sorry, are negatively associated with pro-environmental norms. Horizon Zero Dawn can reinform reinforce such norms, in particular through the player's identification with Aloy, who acts with empathy and altruism toward the many diverse characters she encounters, and who provides a model for a morality-based defiance of traditional authority. While Aloy is not necessarily an environmentalist like her predecessor Elizabeth Sobek, she can help to instill values in players that are consistent with norms of pro-environmental action. Stern discusses four types of interventions that can shape values and change behavior in people. Moral appeals, providing education and information, incentives and rewards like rewards and punishments, and establishment of social expectations. Stern adds that by far the most effective behavior change programs involve combinations of intervention types. Horizon Zero Dawn makes moral appeals for altruistic actions and for environmental preservation. It provides information about the future consequences of climate change and potential consequences of expanding military technology. The game's format incentivizes Aloy's altruism by providing in-game rewards. Finally, her actions and the gratitude she receives from NPCs helps to establish altruistic social expectations and the pro-environmental norms associated with them. Of course, playing the game one time through is not necessarily going to bring about change in an individual by itself. Synaptic change and shifts in social norms come about through strong emotional response and repetition. A game like Horizon Zero Dawn provides one instance of reinforcing these essential pro-social and pro-environmental values. Recurring cultural instances across various media that champion these values will eventually bring about widespread change in the population. Uh, before pro-environmental behavior norms can be established in an individual with altruistic values, uh, that individual must also hold certain beliefs about the world and how it works. As Stern explains, one must believe that environmental conditions threaten things the individual values, 
and that the individual can act to reduce the threat. Studies on environmental preference and self-determination theory can explain why a game like Horizon Zero Dawn may be effective in establishing and or reiterating these beliefs. One of the first things that reviewers of the game tend to point out is its aesthetic landscape, which is loosely based on the mountain west region of America. Research on environmental preference by environmental psychologists gives us an understanding of why the simulated landscape itself carries such an appeal for players and how the gameplay makes optimal use of such appeal. First, humans generally find more aesthetic beauty in natural landscapes as opposed to a built one. This explains the appeal of many games with natural, set natural settings, especially other open world games that allow for free exploration. Humans show the greatest aesthetic preference for natural landscapes with green, open areas that include water, complexity, and biodiversity. Visually, we prefer landscapes with scenic depth. Horizon Zero Dawn offers an abundance of this kind of aesthetically pleasing natural imagery and perspective. Humans also prefer roominess, complexity, and opportunities for activity in environment. Horizon Zero Dawn includes very few interior spaces. Even most of the major city meridian is in the open, and you almost never have to battle indoors or even in any kind of enclosed space. Of course, personal preferences vary, and some players enjoy more claustrophobic interiors of a game like Bioshock or Control. However, from a survival perspective, the open space allows for increased opportunities for movement that can be used to either establish a strategic advantage or to escape damage. The game's design allows for optimal character interaction with the landscape as well. Prospect Refuge theory argues that humans show a preference for the edges between open areas like plains that provide prospect, and closed areas like a forest that provide refuge. This makes sense from an evolutionary perspective as it allows humans to see potential dangers and or resources, but also to quickly escape any perceived threats. One of the most effective ways to hunt machines in Horizons on is to make use of these edges and use stealth. By hiding in tall grasses, Aloy can see what machines she will be fighting, scan them for weaknesses, set traps, sneak up for silent kills and or to override or get a damaging first shot off first before intense fighting ensues. There are also many opportunities for her to establish higher ground over opponents, again giving her an advantage for prospect and refuge. Her likelihood of survival is greatly increased by the opportunities that the landscape affords for planning and gaining an advantage on human foes and machines that represent threats but that also represent potential for gaining valuable resources that prove helpful within the game. An understanding of environmental preference in humans explains how the player forms a strong connection with the natural environment portrayed digitally in the game, which they affect and interact with through Aloy. Thus, the landscape itself potentially adds to the value that the player attributes to nature, which adds an emotional layer to the game's themes of environmental destruction. Along with Believing that the natural world has value, one also must believe that they can make a difference in preserving it. For this to happen, it is important that one generally has a sense of control and perceives themselves as having the ability to affect the world. Self-determination theory, or SDT, developed by Richard Ryan and Edward Desi, argues that there are three innate psychological needs that are the basis of intrinsic motivation in humans. Relatedness, the need to affiliate with others. Autonomy, a sense of meaningful choice, self-expression and free will. And competence, the need to achieve mastery. Celia Hodent discusses in her book, The Gamer's Brain, how the meeting of each of these needs is highly relevant to video game design. In Horizon Zero Dawn, the gamer playing as Aloy experiences autonomy in specific choices they make throughout the game and in how they choose to navigate its open world. More importantly, the gamer masters the gameplay and through that achievement of competence, they rescue the alternative reality world from environmental disaster. While Aloy's specific actions in the game do not correlate with the less dramatic pro-environmental actions that players might ideally adopt as norms, 
Studies drawing from SDT by Webb and Sautor and DeGroote and Steg have found a correlation between fulfillment of intrinsic needs and pro-environmental behavior in individuals. Based on these studies, feeling autonomous and competent is expected to favor the adoption of pro-environmental behavior. Potent uses SDT to explain why a good game is motivating to players. Because the gameplay of Horizon Zero Dawn is both challenging and fun, players are intrinsically motivated to explore its environmentalist themes. But mastering and winning the game can give rise to general feelings of competence and confidence that one can make a difference in the real world. Horizon Zero Dawn has a fairly overt environmental message, but also encourages general values and beliefs through play that are associated with pro-environmental behavioral norms. Players learn about potential environmental consequences. Through, ident through identification with Aloy, they are encouraged to act through altruistic values associated with pro-environmental behavior. The game's aesthetically pleasing and functional natural landscape reinforces beliefs about nature's value. Intrinsically motivating and rewarding gameplay encourages belief about personal effectiveness, also associated with pro-environmental behavior. While Aloy is a digital hero within an alternate reality, the game encourages us to adopt values, beliefs, and norms in our real current world that, if not necessarily rising to the level of heroic in scale, or at least helpful uh, to the natural environment in intention. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Can we get, if you're in the RuneScape uh, server, can we get a little clap going on? <laughs> Applause. Thank you for yeah. your wonderful paper. That was excellent. Um, so oh, we're going to you. move on to the next and then we'll take questions after. So we have, let me switch over to the lovely Merlin. So. We have uh, speaking with us for our next panelist, Dr. Merlin Zeller from the University of Edinburgh. Hello, <laughs> thanks for joining us. So Dr. Merlin Zeller completed their M MA and MST at St. Andrews in Oxford respectively, obtaining their doctoral thesis at the University of East Anglia concerning transmedia and remediating works between film, photography and painting. They are a proudly pansexual, non-binary academic with a background in art history and visual cultural studies and teaching experience in game design. They are currently a lecturer in design and screen cultures at the University of Edinburgh, working across film, comics, media and game studies, appointed in 2019. Their, research, uh, their present research interests concern phenomenology, horror and the non-human turn in new media. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Merlin. And if you do have slides... Hi everyone, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak. Uh, I'm Merlin Seller, currently lecturing in design and screen cultures at University of Edinburgh. Uh, my research interests in game studies are focused on presentations, representations and articulations of plant life, temporality and the non-human particular interest in horror and science fiction. In discussing human-critter relationships in games, I'm here helping to add to the excellent work of Krzysztof Jansky concerning animals in games and Delanda Chan concerning ecology. With its focus on a human, on Aloy, Horizon might seem an unpromising example with which to start exploring these non-human issues. We might expect the hero's journey of Horizon to be what Donna Haraway characterizes as, gender notwithstanding, a prick tale. So for Haraway, a conventional hero narrative is, quote, a tragic story with only one real actor, one real world maker, the hero. This is the man-making tale of the hunter on a quest to kill and bring back a terrible bounty. This is the cutting, sharp, combative tale of action that defers the suffering of gluttonous earth rugged passivity beyond bearing. All others in the prick tale are props, ground, plot space, or prey. They don't matter. Their job is to be in the way, to be overcome, to be the road, the conduit, but not the traveller, not the begetter. The last thing the hero wants to know is that his beautiful words and weapons will be worthless without a bag, a container, a net. What I intend to argue, however, is that Horizon's protagonist and a kinfolk cast of AI, dinosaurs and plants makes us consider that earthy container, the landscape, in meaningful ecological ways. Through the game's self-reflexivity and its focus on staying with the trouble in a world of mess and magnitude. If game studies as a discipline is often concerned with action and actors 
conventional heroes with human characters and core mechanics, then I want to instead start addressing earth-rotted passivity in a normally interactive medium. The lowly assets we dismiss as backdrop to the action. In short, the game's focus on hummus as much as humanity. The plot of this open-world narrative action game bears some recapitulation. So in short, before the present moment of the games, a thousand years in our future, 21st century killer robots destroy the biosphere and all living humans. But, thankfully, a human-built backup of the planet subsequently rebuilds the biosphere over centuries using slightly less killer robots. Discord between humans and between AI, however, leads to a new generation of humans emerging too early, ignorant of the past and perceived as threats to the ecosystem by some of its machines. The player picks up here, working to bridge plant, robot, and human worlds. So the structure of the talk hits three points. First, looking at self-reflexive and meta-commentary within the game and its development, uh, then looking at landscape proper, and finally, by way of uh, an extended conclusion, considering the speculative and empathy. Within Horizon Zero Dawn, we see a fictional world that reflects on the consequences and complexities of generating worlds, and the anthropogenic, which is to say, human made construction of landscape. I will establish first that Horizon uses self-reflexive signifiers of its production to do three things. To comment on the co-constructive nature of landscape, to facilitate player involvement by blending digital and material worlds, and to enable critical thought about authorship and iteration in world building on vast scales. Horizon bends the work of a huge AAA team towards a unified aesthetic Gesamtkunstwerk the mode of a open world, PlayStation prestige game, we might say. It renders a beautiful, terraformed, post-post apocalypse. Its prospects reveal a game engine metaphorized, terraforming giants, asset-producing cauldrons, and the rusted version history of past human and AI iterations. Crucially, our interface is itself a piece of pre-apocalypse tech that can speak with the hidden programs and codes that have built the world around our character, superimposing views of the past onto their present ruins. Instead of the nebulous synesthesia or extrasensory perception of games like Last of Us or Assassin's Creed's Eagle Sight, our focus, as it's called here, taps into concrete exegetic networks from an ancient society. Here, the diegetic and the mechanical align almost uncannily, where Jesper Yule's half-real rules and half-unreal fiction map onto each other. These ghosts of NPC footprints are patrol paths programmed into the world's robotic animals, both literally and figuratively, not just a shorthand or non-diegetic convenience for the player. And Far Cry-like towers here are in fact living creatures inhabiting the world, and a role in the ecosystem which we co-opt and adapt to. They are not just gamified minimap tools. As Brendan Keogh argues, games are always hybrid objects involving player bodies both in front of and behind screens, engaging us in spaces that are both material and digital, and this facilitates players reflecting on the landscape around them. Indeed, Game Informer's Matt Miller has even composed a real-world road trip that connects multiple in-game vistas, attaching the imagined landscape of the game to the imagined landscape of a tourist to Utah or Colorado. Relating to Alenda Chang's concept of the game as mesocosm, player involvement in a world frames ecological awareness as something practical, mid-level, and messy. Mesocosm here is a model between the clean abstraction of the lab, or an awareness of the narrative arc, and the earthy messiness of the wild, the scale of play. Human-non-human -human relationships in Horizon are intimate, self-aware, and comprise different perceptual and material landscapes, then. The Prelapsarian society here decided to sacrifice themselves and wipe the slate clean, leaving godlike machines to rebuild and repopulate the world again and again until they get it right, much like Gorilla's own rapid iteration framework, where development, managing director Herman Holtz tells us, proceeded through exceptionally rapid trialing of vertical game slice prototypes and iterating upon them. Even at the moment of play, 
The game streams assets through procedural generation. Level designers mapping water courses and roads and elevations, then deriving assets with which to populate it, in a process uncannily similar to the fictive AI and their rule-based recovery of the biosphere. In memorable sequences digging through ruined bunkers, we were even interested, introduced to a fictive development team. Ether, for example, is built to perform quality assurance by checking the composition of the atmosphere, Hephaestus building robotic engines, much as Gorilla built the game's literal engine, then Decima. Horizon's world, crafted by an AI named Gaia and periodically wiped by a critical AI called Hades, is based initially on the industry's principle of fail fast, fail often, but comes to embed empathy, care, and ecological awareness into its processes, through Gaia's evolving sentience, its melancholy over the passing of the megafauna and the great extinctions, and the friction this generates with Hades' inflexibility. Here, the narrative reflects critically on the progress model of Silicon Valley and game devs' mantra of fail upwards. With Hades, Callousness threatens care, and the perfect becomes the enemy of the good. Like Halberstrom argues in The Queer Art of Failure, Horizon instead encourages us to reinterpret success, to see the value in failure, not just as a means to another end, and become with the agencies of this world, rather than master or suppress them. Learning and avoiding threats as much as battling them in the game, and thwarting enemy plans to remove humanity from the ecosystem. To build on our appreciation of this postmodern, posthuman, reflexive ecosystem, let's consider the bedrock of this world through theories of the landscape. Horizon's landscape may seem to be a romantic and idealized one, but subtended by the artifice we've seen, this landscape engages with the man made and the posthuman, the anthropogenic and the post anthropogenic. As Simon Sharma argues, and Horizon demonstrates, landscapes as we perceive them are always historical and constructed not natural aggregations of objects. Quote, landscape is the work of the mind. Its scenery is built up as much from the strata of memory as from layers of rock. In W.J.T. Mitchell's terms, landscape is a, quote, cultural medium, unquote, a, a technology that fosters ideologies of nationhood and affordances of resource extraction and aestheticization. In Horizon, however, this is not a purely human construct, but the product of multiple excavating species across time, human, machine, and plant. This construction is a collaboration, one made between machines, machines, that uh, machines plants, and humans. Machines fertilizing plants, plants eroding concrete, and humans parasitizing machines. Moreover, it's one perceived from an embodied observer, one who's never static, always thinking the landscape in motion, as a space perceived by the body holistically, giving us presence, location, and attachment, in line with Merleau-Ponty's idea of space as being something perceived through the body as a whole, as it moves. This aggregate of imagination, of cultural construction, embodied perception, and materiality is exemplified in open-world games like this, where the player explores environmental narrative through characters they internalize kinesthetically, as Celia Pierce argues, this occurs through proprioception, the experience of sensing our bodies through muscle memory, giving us a sense of place. The anthropologist Tim Ingold, building on Barbara Bender's work, emphasizes the importance of both temporality and materiality in understanding how notions of landscape change. However, his key argument stresses that historians need to critically overcome a false distinction between the concept of the landscape as an objective reality, as some sort of pure nature, and to view it as a complete cultural construct, something relativist, and only predicated on our perceptions and internal models of it. Neither stance, he argues, is sufficient explanation of landscapes as they exist, and instead he appeals to dwelling as a model of thinking through the landscape. Landscape as we experience it is anthropogenic, it does not exist before it is altered by human presence, and could be better described as a taskscape. For every hole dug, there is a, a mound made somewhere else. There is no neutral state. Landscape remains stubbornly material, thing-like, but also always in a process of becoming with other objects, to use Haraway's language. Similar to Mitchell's understanding of landscape as a cultural verb, rather than simply a passive object acted on, or a subject constituting itself, 
With angled, we can see that horizon represents a landscape as a dynamic thing, a material process constantly articulating human and non-human activity in a chain, an ecosystem that enfolds us. We can see this articulated by the drawing of environments during play in Horizon. Frustum culling, only drawing what's in the field of view, builds and deconstructs the landscape from the situated view of the player, who is thus not a neutral position, but one of multiple partial vantages. Timothy Morton would treat this as a demonstration of the hyperobject of an ecosystem, an appreciation that the vastness of the world means that it never coincides fully with how it appears to us individually. Landscape is thus performative, constructive, and redistributing itself materially. And in Horizon's fiction and rendering processes, we see environments which fundamentally construe the landscape as dwelt in Ingold's sense, from the buried archives of bunkers to the AR visions of landmarks and the slow inevitability of plant matter breaking down skyscrapers. Far from a romantically sublime or timeless vision, this is a historical processual temporal landscape, the taskscape of AI, humans, robots, and flora. Indeed, it is one which draws on many real-world locations and vistas from Utah, Colorado, and Yellowstone Park, meshing these topographies with procedurally placed objects to create a messy, material, and co-constructed place. A strength of Horizon's narrative for wrestling with the scale of ecology here is that its temporal landscape embodies deep time. Not just a 1,000-year-long narrative premise, but Martin Rudwick's formulation of deep time as the geological time of the landscape, and Horizon's staging of the history of attempts to reconstruct an unseen past. Deep time here is not just magnitude, but a very modern relationship to time and the landscape around us, in which we become aware, with considerable vertigo, of the unforeseen vast spatial and temporal scales of our world. The traces of terraforming and the fictive AR interface mechanics which superimpose its past on the present generates a bit of a tremor of what Timothy Morton calls a being quake, upsetting our centrality to the world, providing an imaginative space for what Alenda Chang calls, quote, interaction across scalar levels, unquote. This is true even when we stand still. The landscape moves around us, directing our attention to the unsung hero of this taskscape, procedurally generated plant matter. As the plant philosopher Michael Martyr argues, our plant-blind society tries its best to forget that on a long enough time scale, we're all really just plant food. Horizon, however, forces us to stay with the plant kingdom and be humbled by its temporal and spatial scale. In the words of NPC Silence, there is so much to be discovered before the world ends. Following Morton's thinking on our already elapsing apocalypse, you might say, even if the world as we know it has already ended, there is still so much more to discover. From, from the embodied perspective of Aloy, we do not defer the suffering of gluttonous, earth rotted passivity, but make it felt effectively through time, space, empathy, and kinship with plants and robots, as we interact with both violently and, both violently and non violently. Similar to Morton's dark ecological thinking, for Haraway, Staying with the trouble means engaging with life and death even in compromises, losses, and counterintuitive complexities. It's an imperative to disturb ourselves with exposure to unforeseen cascades of cause and effect, with a respect for the intelligence and interconnectedness of all life, with an awareness that we ourselves, with our technologies and our microbiomes, are already paradoxically less and more than humans, a coexistence of multitudes. All of these revelations are enacted through the audio logs, holograms, and archaeological artifacts of deep time under the soil, and the, com the complex, emergent, and enacted narratives of shadowing and diagnosing the machines and mechanisms of beings all around us. Indeed, foxes, one of the few biological animals in this game, share animations with the robot dinosaurs, speaking to the interconnectedness and cyborg subjectivities at play. We learn later, in fact, that we ourselves are fictively the clone of the original human designer, brought to life by Gaia to resolve the contradictions of this world stuck between iterations. As Aloy, we are both creator and created. In a broken and revised world, we are player, playtester, and diegetic developer all at once. In Aloy's own words, I'm not a person, 
I'm an instrument. Horizon thus fosters ecological awareness, or ecognosis, and transitions the player rapidly from the dark depression of the apocalypse as revealed, through the dark uncanny, and into the dark sweetness of play in which we come to terms with what Morton describes as the dizzying, ungraspable complexity of looping coexistence, all surrounded by the temporal landscape. Player hacking of robots here might be read as an instrumental hierarchical relationship to nature, but to my mind it falls closer to Haraway's symbiotic compost children, humans of the future who have adapted themselves in order to live alongside animals. Here we grow with kin in life and death, and undisturbed, these mechanical bodies in Horizon are drones of the AI, and in cooperation with the player, switch allegiances rather than ceding autonomy. This, I hope, is multi-species worlding with care, as Aloy comes to understand and treat the Hades plague of derangement by these means, she reflects Anat Singh's arts of living on a damaged planet. The imperative that we should explore practical healing over delusions of perfect moral solutions and collaborate across and beyond traditional ontological categories. This is a game, moreover, of speculative fabulation, the other SF of Donna Haraway's interest in science fiction. Concerning these critters in imagining diverse, more multi-species worlds, and in this endeavour, its robot dinosaurs hold much in sympathy with works of speculative evolution, such as Dougal Dixon's speculative bass-turned T-Rex of the future, 65 million years from now. Indeed, as Horizon's temporal landscape spans Utah, the world's richest area of dinosaur fossil deposits, it resonates with a field of speculative paleo-art, as say reconstructions of extinct animals. You can see this in its relation to the old yesterday's movement pictured here, which attempts to move beyond dinosaur bones and their muscular attachments, the kind of lycra-clad dinosaurs of svelte, fast-moving velociraptors, to be creative and generative with an expanded horizon of possibility in our imaginative interactions with the unknowns of natural history, rethinking integument and behaviour, and expanding the possibility space of how animals might have and might yet look. And B. In short, it matters whether our horizons seem to hem us in or invite us onwards, as Chang says. Horizon, I argue, gives a view of environmental heroism from multiple inviting elevations, and amongst the earthy critters, as well as augmented reality spans of AI's deep time. One final thought before I conclude. There is a moment where our character finally appears to have access to Apollo, that is, to an archive of all pre-fall knowledge. But Aloy sees it for what it is, keenly seeing that only one level of scalar understanding is encompassed by this, one of many, in relation to which she and her posthuman kin still matter irreducibly. In this scene, all the servers and archives in the Old World Cradle, which in other narratives would be interactive hero assets, the ultimate MacGuffin, are here silent background objects. Like the plant life above ground, they are both reduced to mechanically non-interactive things and elevated to imaginative assets of infinite player projection. Horizon argues that without thinking both above and below ground, across scalar levels, we're committed to repeating past mistakes, and that the power of an environment is the interdependence of its parts, the kinship of its characters, the imaginative folds of its landscape. Fantasy is not escape, as Rosemary Jackson argues, but articulates the social and environmental context that generate it. And by shaking up being in a world reeling from military-industrial complex run amok, Horizon points towards interesting modes of kinship that might fulfill Atlanta Chang's desire to show us, quote, how he might make a start in the face of looming or already elapsed calamities, unquote. Aloy's story is one of finding kin in a dynamic, speculative container, rather than the Campbell-esque hero's journey. And through its self-reflexive articulations of the landscape, Horizon allows us to begin thinking ecologically across species at multiple scales. Thank you. Let's have a look in the uh, at the questions. So we have questions to heroes. So um, we'll work down them in order. So first of all, Leandro, could you kindly either paste your question into the chat or unmute your mic and ask your question? Thank you. 
So the question, I think, is more to thought, but uh, I think for Merlin as well might be useful. Uh, so basically, uh, as I was listening to it, and I've been playing Horizon Zero Dawn, not a big fan, but interesting game. Uh, I've worked with two of my students for the past term with two different concepts that I think might, they are somewhat related to what you both are doing. That's the idea of environmental storytelling, which is pretty much straightforward. It is about the ways that environment tells stories, which I think is something that you all mentioned. Uh, but also environmental identification, um, which was something that we didn't really read anything about before. But I feel it's highly connected to this idea of the ecofeminism uh, that Todd was mentioning but also the motivations and how the game can kind of inspire some some kinds of thought regarding um, the environment and environmental issues, environmental politics, and et cetera, et cetera. So my, my question, and then I think it's a good question for both of you, uh, is whether these ideas, the idea of environmental storytelling or environmental identification in the sense of more reception studies kind of oriented uh, research would be interesting uh, for your own current research on these things in Horizon Zero and also going to give even more insight uh, about this, these topics that you're discussing. Um, I don't know if you want to go, if you have some immediate thoughts, Todd, or uh, for my go, part. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, my background is in art history, so I, I tend to use kind of mix. <laughs> Art history is a kind of uh, invisible or unwritten constitution of methodology, which involves kind of mixed resource base. And it's usually like a mixture of looking at, say, sort of discourse study around like press reception. Um, and that's sort of stuff which I usually engage, engage in thinking about other games. Uh, though I do like basically doing close readings of texts and thinking about basically their construction and material components and how they signify in relation to theory primarily. Uh, what was I going to say? But you might say that. Uh, uh, I guess I'm maybe taught us something to say about quantitative research if or empirical studies, and I'm I'm more I guess here for thinking about things theoretically and has how they engage with communities or senses of community or imagined landscapes and cultural studies mode basically, which is usually or as Murray argues in non-gaming cultural studies approaches tend to be kind of absent or visual studies especially from from games. So people like Joey J T Mitchell's work. Uh, iconology, that kind of is where I usually come. Yeah, I think I think I lost the sound a little bit at the very end of your question, but um, uh, you can fill in if I'm missing something. But I mean, there's certainly been a lot of, uh, it's interesting to think about identification with landscape because there's so much, uh, there's a lot of research on identification with characters, right, that, uh, that There's a lot of research on valuing landscape, but not so much identification with with landscape. Um, but I think that's that's something important that uh, certainly the uh, I guess all of all of the uh, people in environmental humanities are starting to talk about right that uh, we have to kind of think about what how how we are part of the landscape right that that uh, that it is part of our identity. Um, and I think stories like like Horizon and probably other things can uh, can help us to do that, right? Beyond just identifying with characters. Um, hope that answers what you you were asking. Yeah. yeah, it's just it's just to explore a little bit more. And I I don't know to I don't know much about this field of environmental humanities and etc. So I think um, and this idea of environmental identification that appeared in one of my students' work was really because of she was conducting some interviews and then they were saying it was about Fallout 4 and some of them were just saying that somehow that word reminded them of, of some places in, in their own lived realities and their own, maybe their cities or places where they fre frequented or something like that and that would make them more involved with the game itself 
And I feel like in the case of Horizon Zero Dawn, from what I've played so far, that might even be more present, uh, especially to discuss uh, these topics that you are about environmental and ecofeminism. Yeah, it is neat to me in the game, just because my uh, my family lives out in. Uh, that is one element of the game where there's this realism. I mean, it's kind of loose with the landscape, right? It's not mapped out exactly, but uh, you see these landmarks that you uh, uh, you identify that you recognize in the game, right? Like there's the the Denver uh, Broncos Stadium, and I'm like, oh, I've stood in front of that. Um, so that adds a really, I think. Uh, I don't know, neat and, and probably important element in terms of identifying with uh, with the environment. So yeah, yeah a good point. Cool, thank you so much. That's a really fascinating question. Uh, so let's go to uh, Matt Horrigan, please. We could ask you a question, either type it in the chat and I'll read it out or um, unmute your mic. Ah, oh, lovely, thanks. Hello, hello. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna paste it in the chat and I'm also gonna speak it. Um, here we go. Here's here's my question. Okay, so so um, yeah, so I have a question for Merlin. So you cite Timothy Morton and Donna Haraway, um, s uh, material semiotics together with object or uh, object oriented ontology. Um, as far as I understand, the main objection the OOO crew have for Haraway is that material semiotics tends heavily toward relativism, and thus lacks the objectivist dimension required to underpin claims about climatological facts and the like, which persist even when we don't believe in them. Uh, I very much like your metaphor of landscape as a task space where for every hole dug somewhere, there's a pile of dirt made somewhere else. Um, so uh, do you have a position regarding objects withdrawn from the player, as in objects which persist even when they're not dug into at all. Uh, so in an open world game, is there any trouble that exists, but that we could potentially not stay with? That's a really interesting question. And yeah, you're right. I've been thinking a lot actually about how Haraway and Morton mesh and don't mesh in the way that they think about kinds of radical new kinds of ontology and relationship and also with kind of dark compromised uh, ethics in different ways. I, I tend to side with Haraway more than I do with the Uru crew. Um, or, I tend to get around this by thinking about points or other kinds of theorists which tend to mesh their approaches in interesting ways. So for that, Tim Timothy Ingold stands, kind of th I think, an interesting stand-in in in his work in anthropology, talking about uh, the co-construction of realities between various different participants. So there's a, there is a materiality there, but it is accessible in different ways. Um, but in partial and situated ways, um, and he acknowledges those kind of problems. Or in the work of uh, Bill Brown and Thing Theory, Thing Theory being a kind of, almost like a skew of that relativist uh, humanities mode, which approaches a sense of at least trying to en engage with radical otherness in radical ways. Um, I I'm really sorry the slides weren't working there, and also I couldn't see the chat whilst presenting, because there was full screen, and it... but in there, you can find online, um, GIFs of, or indeed like other games use this, Frost and Culling as a way of like showing objects. So like, there are other ob objects are being simulated in real time around uh, around the environment, but you're only visibly able to see a skew of them, right? This sort of like this roving camera which highlights objects and brings them into kind of being. And it's, that does seem to like sort of, I guess, engage with Morton and Harmon's sense of like the withdrawal of objects. You just see these sort of sensuous properties at the surface level visually in this game, it seems. But at the same time, like, you're you're doing imaginative work as a player to think through all these kinds of crazy scales and temporal relationships. And these narratives persist. Like you're, you're operating on multiple different levels of time. So you're not just... You are trying to engage with those other sides of objects which aren't ordinarily accessible to humans. I do buy the argument, though, that even if you're holding a coin and you know the other side of the coin or you turn, to see, turn the coin to see the other side, you still only ever see it as it presents itself to you but I think it's worth still trying, I guess. Another shorter answer would be animal studies <laughs> attempts to address alien subjectivities as an ineffable thing. We can never know, but we should still try, try and fail <laughs> uh, repeatedly. Okay. Well, well think, oh, sorry, did you have something to add? Can I, can I just ask? 
Um, I, I can uh, I can ask for what was the word that you said? I heard something like a uh, fustum culling or something when you're referencing the technique. Sure. Yeah, I'll just type it in the a campfire okay, thank you. chat there. It's frustum culling, uh, which is in other games, but it's exceptionally apparent there. And Gorilla makes a big part of this in how they marketed the engine. Uh, <laughs>